So just to change gears a little bit, um, I, I was pleased to see that you had an article in Vox recently. Mm. You went back to your sort of astrophysics training, and it, you know it was a story about um, the application of probabilities to interesting questions about the nature of the universe. So why don't you fill us in on what that was? Yeah. Um, so recently, uh, some of this, the researchers at the Future of Humanity Institute in, in Oxford um, published a paper on called Dissolving the Fermi Paradox, um, which I imagine most viewers know what the Fermi Paradox is. Let's not imagine that. Let's tell them what it is. Okay. Fermi Paradox is basically... Um, well, Enrico Fermi back in, when was it, 1960-ish, 53? 50s. Yeah, he... He you know, didn't live into the 60s. He didn't. He was very radioactive, yeah. <laughs> Bad. Um, but yeah, basically, he, you know, he looked up, he was like, wait, there seem to be billions, if not trillions, of stars out there, and we know that the universe is somewhere around 14 billion years old. If there's so many possible sites for life, why are we not at least you know we, we've been releasing radio waves now for you know a few decades yeah. like f relatively easily surely we should be at least hearing or picking up trace signals from other worlds or seeing aliens all the time like they, the universe is so old there should there must be at least a few other thousand civilizations out there that have got a big head start on us so where where is everybody and so that's the like famous fermi paradox like the the contradiction between the size and age of the universe and the lack of observed alien life um and so this paradox has seemingly only gotten stronger with time as, as you know, we've, we've become more spacefaring um, and we've discovered more and more exoplanets. And, you know, it seems like there are, you know, universes even sort of more, more capable of hosting life than we imagined. Certainly a lot of places out there There's where so it many could places. be. Right. Yeah. And, and, yet, and yet we've still seen nothing and we've been, you know, really looking hard. And anyway, so this paper... Um, that they published use, uses the Drake equation, which was sort of this uh, equation that sort of is the best way we could try and estimate the number of intelligent civilizations within the Milky Way. Um, and it does a sort of novel form of analysis on it that hadn't been really done before. Um, and the answers that sort of came out the back of that is that we are somewhere around... 75% to be the only intelligent civilization within the galaxy and somewhere around a coin flip, about 50-50, to be the only intelligent civilization in the entire observable universe, which is pretty pretty astonishing stuff. Right. Um, counterintuitive to many people. Extremely yes. counterintuitive, agreed. Uh, also quite disappointing because I'd love there to be some aliens out there. Um, I mean, at least from curiosity standpoint. Um, but yeah, nonetheless, pretty groundbreaking um, claim. And so the article was sort of discussing how they came to that claim, what the actual processes that they, that they did, the, the me methods of analysis. Um, but then I wanted to make a sort of larger point from that, which is, OK, well, we, we, we don't know for certain that this is actually the case, but let's assume that it is based upon our current best state of knowledge. It seems like we're, if nothing else, life is extremely intelligent, life is extremely rare in the universe. What does that mean, um, philosophically speaking? Hmm. Um, for for us, if we really are the only intelligent civilization out there, and may may well be for the rest of the universe's future, what what does that mean? You know, what uh, uh, should we do anything with that information? Should we uh, change any of the behaviors that we're currently uh, exhibiting and the trajectories that we seem to be putting ourselves onto? And I I think yes, I think we it speaks that we have a greater responsibility. Right. Uh, to not blow ourselves up. I do want to get into that, but first I want to dig into this probability stuff yeah. because the Drake equation is something that has been, you know, batted around ad nauseum, right? Like people right. love talking about the Drake equation. And so for the for the two of you out there in podcast land who have not heard about it, the Drake equation is a way of estimating the number of intelligent civilizations by saying, well, how many planets are there times what's the fraction of planets on which life develops mm -hmm. times what's the fraction on which the life becomes intelligent. It's, you know, different ways of breaking it down. But as far as I can tell, there's quite a, two things in the new paper that are kind of interesting. One is they take seriously the idea of rather than finding just our best fit number for the fraction of times life comes into existence and then becomes multicellular, they say, what's the uncertainty or what is the probability distribution? So right. taking those probabilities a little bit more seriously. And secondly, it is a matter of being good Bayesians and updating our priors, right? I mean, they're, they're not saying 
just based on the laws of physics, we're probably the only intelligent civilization in the galaxy. They're saying based on the fact that we haven't seen it yet, right? That, that, that in some sense, Fermi was right. It would have been very, very easy to run into another civilization if they were out there. They're, we haven't seen them. They don't seem to be out there. And therefore, from that, we draw the conclusion that probably the simplest explanation is they're just not there. Maybe it's just way more unlikely that intelligent civilizations exist and continue to exist than we thought it might have been. Right, exactly. The, 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 the fact that we haven't found any evidence of aliens is evidence unto itself right. and should be incorporated into sort of the, the Bayesian model that we have of the situation. Were they able to pinpoint one of the factors and say this is probably the tiny one? Um, in terms of which one has the... The smallest probability. Is it that, that life well, doesn't usually form? Or yeah, so the, well, the one that has form? the biggest number of range of uncertainty on it is a fraction of planets that develop life. Okay, which um, makes perfect sense. What do we know yes, about that? Right? Exactly. Like we, we still haven't really figured out how life started on, on Earth. The process of abiogenesis is just really not well understood yet um and so the the difficulty that we've had with the drake equation is that before we're, we're sort of plugging in numbers like the rate of st uh, stellar, stellar genesis within you know the number of stars that develop per year we that's a that's an astronomical number we have a reasonably accurate we have number data for on that exactly stuff, yeah. we have data for that but then something like the fraction of planets that develop life it could literally be uh, the the uncertainties. They, they they have like two hundred orders of magnitude of uncertainty. Oh my goodness! Yeah, okay. it's that it's that <laughs> much. Yeah. And and the thing is, is that because like that's those any number between that is actually completely plausible. By saying, oh well, yeah, but let's ignore the fringe parts right. of it. That's making a statement. That's making a claim of knowledge that we can't make. Yeah. You know, say, oh well, it's probably somewhere in the middle. No, like it, it's as can see, you know, the, the probability distribution is, is like fat tailed all right. the way down. Right. And so to cut these off is, is, is just doing bad math, basically. Um, yeah, I'm glad the paper came out because I've run into great uh, resistance. Uh, for, I, I've always felt basically this, like we don't know how likely it is that life's going to exist. The other obvious um, bottleneck is multicellular life, which right. again, we don't know how that exists. Maybe, I, I tend to think that once we get multicellular life, intelligence is probably not far behind. Yes. But both the existence of life itself and multicellularity seem like very mysterious. Maybe the chances are just 10 to the minus 100, right? And people right. say, there are so many planets out there and I'm like, like there's yeah, no that's... number <laughs> N such that I cannot find another number that multiplies it and gives us a small number. A tiny, right? tiny, it's... tiny number, exactly. Yeah, um... I mean, there's sort of the idea of like this, this great filter where there's some kind of insurmountable barrier that exists somewhere in the, in, the, in the chain of evolution that, for whatever reason, most planets can't get past. Right. And for some reason, Earth managed to get past it. Um, like, I, I hate to even like hazard a guess at where it is, but like intuitively, not that intuition's really applied to this, yeah. it feels to me that it's somewhere... Um, in the step from sing singular, oh, pro sorry, prokaryotic to, to eukaryotic life, somewhere around there. Um, but again, that's just that's my... true. So not just multicellularity, but just the idea of having a nucleus. Exactly, having a cells. having a nucleus within a cell. Um, that's fair. That that's seems to be probably more important. Yeah, something somewhere around that. And um, there's some other work that Future Humanity Institute are doing right now on um, the similar analysis, but looking at the transitionary time the rates right. it takes to go from one, each step to each step and it just seems quite likely that the reason why the earth well, the reason why life isn't everywhere is because it just is it just takes such a long time for it to actually get to the stage where intelligent civilizations then actually spring up right um the the plan you know we we made it on earth five six of the way through of yeah. earth's lifespan yeah in about 750 million Life years. Life came into being relatively Very, quickly. Right. But then it sat around in this boring... Nothing state for ages and ages, form. and then yeah. suddenly oof, this, there was this explosion where evolution got, you know, kick-started faster and, and, and things, interesting things started appearing. Um, but that wasn't basically until five-sixths of the way through of Earth's lifespan. Had it right. just been a little bit longer, we would not have existed because yeah. yeah, Earth would have been gobbled up by the sun. So, right. um, <laughs> And so... That's a reasonably plausible explanation as to as to why um, you know it, life is incredibly rare. 
Um, I suspect that's the right explanation. My other favorite one is that there are plenty of civilizations. They all become highly advanced. They upload their consciousness into computers, and then they become bored, and they don't go space traveling anymore. Yes, that's a good one. Also, the Aestivation hypothesis. You know that one? I don't know that one. Um, you'll be better to explain, explain the exact reason why. Um, but because computation is expensive in, in higher temperatures, in um, and... A ra you would expect a rational civilization that would want to uh, maximize the number of computations it can do okay. over time. <laughs> so it would make sense for them to hibernate or estivate right. okay. uh, until the general temperature of the universe, you know, until far, far in the future, and the uh, the ambient temperature of the universe is much lower, and therefore it's much cheaper. And you can, I think it's something like 10 to the 30 more computations a second you could achieve or something like that. I can't remember exactly. It's Anders Sandberg has a very fun paper on it. Um, I've never heard of that one. I like the audacity of it. I don't believe it. <laughs> no, I, mean, I don't. No, well, no, so I, I'll tell you why I don't believe it. Because on the one, the, the temperature of the universe goes down. That's, right. That's fair. But also the free energy of the universe goes Correct. down. The energy that we have available to run our computation goes down. So I, I presume someone smarter than me has actually done the calculation and said it's still better to wait. But there's clearly a Yeah, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure he factors that in, but yeah. I, I'm not versed enough to explain why. Um, nonetheless, again, it was one that felt intuitive. It was very fun, but intuitively, I'm like, nah. <laughs> Probably, because it only but, takes one, you know, plucky counterexample, right? Only one right. civilization has to not buy into that. Yeah. But it does remind me of John Wheeler used to say, when he mixed cream into coffee, he always felt sad because he was increasing the entropy of the universe yes. irretrievably. But you do bring up this question of what does it mean? What, what, what implications? So what if we are the only civilization, only intelligent life forms? It makes you think, you know, for better or for worse, but making you think is good. Uh, why are we here? What is the point? So, and you've well, actually been thinking about things like this, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I was just having a, having a conversation with my partner, Igor, about sort of moral moral realism. I know that you're very much a non-moral moral realist in terms happy, of... Happy, human constructivist, yes. Yes, um, and I'm of the same, same uh, mindset. But that said... Um, it, it, it if if you want to sort of if nothing else maintain optionality, um, us going extinct is definitely going against that. Like <laughs> now the options have have disappeared to zero, and that seems it definitely appears like there is a very real risk that we can go extinct by even twenty one hundred. And by real risk, it's estimate somewhere between anywhere between like two and twenty percent. I'm a moral Likely. constructivist, but the morals I construct do say that human extinction would be bad. Would be bad, yes. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I don't need an ob objective uh, story to tell myself about it. Right, exactly. And, and yeah, it, it just seems like it would be a terribly big shame if, you know, all this, uh, these little pockets of low entropy have managed to appear us, you know, yeah. Basically, going against the second law of thermodynamics to a degree. Are, are we actually going against the second law of thermodynamics? No, We're not. Nothing goes against the second law of thermodynamics. So, how, this is what I've never wrapped my head around. How do pockets of low entropy so successfully exist then? Well, it's, it's actually an outgrowth of the second law of thermodynamics. Because if we think about it, if it weren't, what would it mean to not have the second law of thermodynamics, right? Mm -hmm. What would it mean is that we were already in thermal equilibrium. Right, we were already right. at our maximal entropy state. Right. right. Once you say the early universe started with low entropy, that's all you need to say. Then entropy increases, and that's the second yes. law. The only way out of that is to say you were already in high entropy, and then there would never be any life. There would never be any complex structures. There would never be anything like I that. I see. We are not creating pockets of low entropy. We are leeching off of the fact that the early universe had an extraordinarily low entropy. We're increasing the entropy of the universe willy-nilly, right? Yes. I mean, we're, there's a separate question, related but separate, which is why are we complicated? Why are there complex mm. structures in the universe? And that's something that it makes sense that complexity develops along the way from low entropy to high entropy. But the details of how it actually happens is an ongoing fun research problem. Mm. And life is certainly just an example of exactly that. Right. And, and so, yeah, I think it would be arguably a tragedy on a universal scale in terms of just lost utility and lost potential um, and, and lost optionality. If, you know, it, even from just a, the expect, looking from an expected value standpoint, right. if we were to go extinct, even if it's a 0.001% chance, there's still going to be... 10 to the, I don't know how many possible lives, you know, and possibly very happy lives in the future. 